two. Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and WNST.net. I'm laughing because I never, ever, ever green room my guests. But John Glennon and I have been knowing each other a long time through the Trotsy People Machine. He writes for The Athletic, covering all things Titans, Predators, soccer. The author of 100 things Predators fans should know and do before they die. One should be hoist the Stanley Cup like I did with Trots as the Capitals. Uh, John Glennon can be found at Glennon on Sports. Um, look, Glennon, man, my place is glowing purple right now. I'm heading down to Miami. I'm going to have sandals on trying to find bars to get big events together and figure out what we can do in South Florida to make something special and memorable. And a 14-2 and two season happened. But, you know, in the way stands like tackling Derrick Henry and stopping Ryan Tannehill. And uh, uh, we've got purple fever here, dude. And you're getting an unlikely a crab cake at Fadley's here in Baltimore on Saturday and, and walking around Baltimore after covering a 2-4 and four football team about the 10 weeks ago. Hey, man, it's Titans and Ravens, the same as it ever was, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, just like everybody predicted. <laughs> well, uh, you know, our end of the bargain is clearly, you know, we've created Michael Jordan and cleats, right? And th there's something really special happening here when you win the way they've won. And then there's the team trying to come in and wreck it, and that's who the Titans are. And they just went in and put Tom Brady on the golf course and been, put Bill Belichick out of business for a season. Uh, you, you know, th that's heady stuff. I, I don't know what that means for this week, but they were impressive on Saturday for whatever impressive can be whenever you win in Foxborough in January. Yeah, I agree. Now, you know, I thought that was a particularly good matchup, as, as strange as that sounds, for the Titans uh, against the Patriots, because if the, if the Titans have a, a decent weakness, I would say it was the secondary. And again, odd as it sounds, the Patriots didn't have a, a particularly good passing attack this game. So I, I figured the Titans might have a decent chance up there outside of the fact that it was in Foxborough and the Patriots almost never lose a home playoff game. Uh, I think the last time they did was you guys back in uh, back in 12 or 13 before the Titans went up there. Uh, um, but, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a different animal uh, for the Titans this week. You know, more of an explosive sir, offense, certainly with the, uh, with the Ravens. Uh, you know, very, very strong defense. So I think the constant for the Titans has been Derrick Henry. Uh, as you mentioned, it's been tough for any team to stop him, even when they know the ball is going to him. question is this week, I think the Titans need a little bit more balance uh, they need a little bit more passing offense than they showed last week. Last week was Ryan Tannehill's first playoff game ever, uh, you know, and, and he didn't look uh, as good as he had coming down the stretch for the Titans. So they're going to need to balance some things out a little bit this week if they want a chance in, in Baltimore. Well, Lamar Jackson's never won a playoff game, right? So th this is his first chance to do that. Prime time. Obviously, television loves him. You know, you stand on the outside of this, right? And and you've covered special athletes and the McNairs and the Eddie Georges and the freak in his prime and waiting for all the Vince Youngs and the Marcus Mariotas to bloom in your own market. Every one of those guys had something shiny about them that made them, if they won a Super Bowl or two, they would have been Hall of Fame and perceived as such and like all of that, right? Uh, in the case of Lamar, you know, we're 12 weeks into this, right? And it feels like some sort of Superman act or some sort of video game. And I'm in the locker room, and I'm around the kid, and he couldn't be any more humble and sort of normal. Uh, I was around Ray Lewis when it was normal and humble, and all of a sudden it wasn't anymore, right? And, yeah. you know, and I don't know what that means, and I, I'm, I'm riding the wave. I, look, I just wrote a goodbye letter to Joe Flacco that made grown men cry because, to me, what Joe Flacco came in here and did as a Delaware graduate and winning a Super Bowl and – making the playoffs every year and winning on the road every year in playoff games and not urinating down his leg in Foxborough. Joe Flacco's the only way he's going to Canton is when he buys a ticket for his family. But, you know, Lamar has captured, I call it Fernando mania because I'm of that age, and I think you are as well, Absolutely. where, yeah, you know, there's just something really transcendent and different. And seeing it from Nashville, seeing it from afar and flying into it this week, I bet there's a little pep in your step about coming to see the greatest show 
you know, since Cam Newton or something like that, right? Uh, absolutely. You know, I, I think a good example is the uh, the Titans radio analyst down here, Dave McGinnis, who was a former long-time assistant coach in the NFL. All-time great uh, dude, right? McGinnis. Really, really great guy. Anyway, during the during the Titans bye week this year, uh, instead of, you know, kicking his, his feet up and, and taking the weekend off, Dave McGinnis asked, I believe it was CBS radio or, or, or some radio, he said, Hey, I'd love to watch Lamar Jackson. Can you get me up to the uh, to the Ravens game? I got to see what this guy looks like. I've got to do a game, and and they hooked him up. Uh, he went up, did the the Ravens game for a radio broadcast, and and just came back gushing. Said, you know, I, I had to see this guy in person to see that you know everything was that was accurate about him. And he said it's just incredible to watch. Um, and that's I think that's what it's been like for for everybody pretty much around the NFL in that way sort of similar to, to Derrick Henry of the Titans in that you know what's coming, it's just that you can't stop it. Uh, you know, no one's been able to do that, certainly for the past 12 weeks, uh, you know, for the uh, uh, against the Ravens. Uh, and I think it's going to be a very, very difficult chore for the Titans to do so. Uh, a, a decent defense for the Titans, but, but two things to keep in mind as they try to stop Lamar Jackson and, and everything that he's been for the Ravens. Uh, a, a, a bit of a shaky secondary. Uh, they've had health problems back there. Malcolm Butler was out, and the, and the Dury Jackson only came back last week, so they're still getting things together. And maybe even a bigger thing to keep your eye on if you're if you're a Ravens fan is the Titans injury report. Uh, Jayon Brown, very good inside linebacker, probably their most mobile, quick uh, inside linebacker, a guy who would be given a lot of responsibility in terms of tracking Lamar Jackson. Got hurt, left the game, did not return uh, against the Ravens with a shoulder injury. We'll have to see what his status is going forward. But if he is not playing, that could be a, a significant loss in trying to slow down uh, Lamar Jackson. John Glennon joining us here at Glennon on Sports is the way to find him out on Twitter and The Athletic. And I am a subscriber. Every time I tell Zrebeck, I see Zrebeck, I'm like, hey, I pay, all right? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm past the wall. All that stuff's good. Uh, just big picture about Nashville. And I, you know, I think I talked to uh, Teresa Walker about this. Other, some other people that have been around there a long time. Uh, you know, the Titans' ability to grasp the market, right? And you've been there forever, and we we go way back with Barry Trotz trying to build it with you know a, a ragtag Predators team and the aftermath of the loss in the Super Bowl that the Titans have always been sort of trying to claw and climb. And the Predators have really sort of owned the town in recent years. I know they're you know amidst the struggle right now, and uh, you know they'd like to have Barry Trotz back at this point apparently. But in the case of the Titans and where they sit in all of this and what Vrabel's trying to build, I mean, they changed quarterbacks 10 weeks ago. I mean, it's certainly not, you know, it's it's not Wonderland around there, right? No, it's not, it's not Wonderland, but I, I think there's a, a much greater belief right now than there has been in a long time. You know, for so many years, uh, we saw the Titans coming close, you know, edging a little bit closer to some sort of respectability, some sort of relevance, to, to, to be honest, over the past decade. And, and falling short, even though, you know, the last, it's made four years in a row winning records, you know, but each of them was nine and seven, uh, only one playoff appearance before this one, and, uh, you know, ended up losing to New England. And I, and I think Titans fans had just grown so used to coming up short, not being a player, you know, not having a real impact in the NFL. They've been hesitant, uh, even over the past few years, to kind of buy in uh, on the Titans. And as you say, I think that's why, the Predators, who are busy going to the Stanley Cup, busy winning the Central Division a couple of years in a row, you know, we're really able to grab the market and, and have sellout after sellout after sellout. But I think now, uh, not only have the Titans been winning down the stretch, but they've been doing something that they haven't done in a long time, and that's be an entertaining team. You know, even in some of the good Marcus Mariota teams, it was all about you know, trying to get to 20 points and, and hang on for dear life with a decent defense. These guys under Tannehill, 10 starts averaged over 30 points a game. So not only were, uh, you know, Titans fans seeing victories, but seeing something that was interesting and, and entertaining to watch. So I think, you know, Titans fans have started to buy in here these, these last few weeks. Uh, you know, hopefully for their sake, they won't get beat by a, a 42 to 7 score this weekend. And, 
and lose a lot of that momentum. But uh, but right now, I think there's a little bit of energy about the Titans team for the first time in a while. You know, we talk so much about the history and Eddie George and Ray Lewis in 2003 here and telling old war stories and Matt Stover kicks and, uh, and, and Al Del Greco misses and all of that stuff. But, but, but more than anything, it's the ownership of the franchise. And and the the loss of Bud Adams and uh, and and Amy taking over and, and and sort of having some sort of philosophy that leads you to Vrabel that leads you to a quarterback that you know sort of got thrown onto the scrap heap because he couldn't win at a place where nobody else could win uh, and sort of the second life for that but Vrabel to me is the difference maker I mean I saw him at the combine maybe maybe you were there as well in Indianapolis two years ago where he stood in front of everybody and it just seemed like. They had hired a grown-up. He did, did not seem like a first-time head coach who was in over his skis. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, I think one of the ways that you saw that, even as recently as this past week, um, it was kind of the constant distancing uh, of Mike Frabel from his Patriots background. Uh, you know, whereas a lot of the players and, and a lot of assistant coaches over the years, you know, I've talked about that everything they learned from the Patriots and the Patriots' way. Uh, and so forth. Mike Frabel kind of steered in a, in a different direction uh, this week, you know, certainly acknowledging Bill Belichick and, and the mentorship, but at the same time making, making it very clear that, you know, they weren't around to be sort of the uh, the, the younger brother of the Patriots, but that this was going to be a different team and that they were here to, to, to knock the Patriots off. You know, when, when the, the Boston media asked Mike Vrabel during the week, they said, you know, what is the, the Patriots way, Mike? His, his response was pretty telling. He said, I think it's the street up by the movie theaters up there. Isn't that, isn't that right? Yeah. You know, it was just kind of an example of him sort of saying, you know, enough of the mystique, enough of the uh, reverence around the Patriots. You know, we're the, we're the Titans, you know, and, and we were coming here to, to knock the Patriots off, and, and certainly they did. Um, and I think that's probably his greatest strength uh, is sort of that, that leadership uh, that, that he brings. He's done that wherever he's been a coach, whether it was Ohio State, you know, I think his first year he was he was like recruiter of the of the year in the in the Big Ten, um, and, and then certainly uh, you know a great job at, at Houston before taking over here. Well, he's now, got some emotional intelligence that far supersedes anything that Bill Belichick would know about, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Now there have been times this year where you've had to cut. I, I think you know maybe that emotion got a little bit the best of him in terms of decision making. He's so aggressive minded. Uh, you know, that there were some calls, maybe some fourth down calls that uh, at least us second guessers up in the press box have been kind of scratching our head on ever since. But he has been consistent. He's an aggressive minded guy. He likes to go for it. Occasionally, I think he has to rein himself in. But he is a, he is a bright guy. He's, a, he's an aggressive guy. You know, I, I at first, I'll be honest, I expected a little bit of a kind of a, I don't know, a, a, a football meathead, uh, if you will, when, when Mike Frabel took over. But a uh, but a very sharp guy, uh, um, and uh, certainly has this team believing that they uh, that they can beat everybody, and that will be very much tested this weekend. John Glennon's been my pal since uh, many moons ago. We he covered the Predators. I kind of hung out with Barry Trotz many moons ago. He now writes for the Athletic, covering the Titans, the Predators, soccer, and all sorts of things, including a, a book on the Predators: uh, One Hundred Things Predators Fans Should Know and Do Before They Die. I like it. I love it. I want some more of it. That's all I can say, John Glennon. So, uh, Fang Fingers is all I can <laughs> is is what I remember uh, for Derrick Henry and beating the Ravens and sort of running over the Ravens, which. Uh, you know, if any of us are going to find a way a 10-point dog's going to win on the road against Lamar Jackson, it's going to be keeping him off the field. That would be the running game. You know, thoughts about seeing that work or not work and seeing it work the last couple of weeks? And I think victory in Houston, impressive. Victory in New England, impressive. I think the hardest thing in the world to do is win three in a row on the road this time of the year, uh, yeah. especially coming in here where Lamar Jackson's got 19 days of rest, apparently beat the flu last week. Um, and... This is just a really – I've been around a lot of teams, dude. You know that, right? I mean, I've been doing this a sure. long time. This is a 14-2 and two team. And when they got their ass kicked in Kansas City, it was a weird locker room experience because I know you've been in that locker room too. It was built by Lamar Hunt. They still have the stools from 1969 in there. You know, it's, it's a closet. And the players mm -hmm. didn't want to leave. And I thought that that was something sort of telling. Usually they're in a hurry to get out of there. These guys sort of like each other. And you sort of build this thing. It would be the shock of all shocks if somehow 
They lose on Saturday night here with the city all painted purple. But stranger things have happened to one seeds. I mean, you've covered a couple of those teams in, in Nashville that were pretty heady about a bye and feeling good about themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And, and who, uh, who, of course, knocked them off uh, a couple of times, but the, the, those very same Ravens. Um, yeah, I, I, it's going to be interesting to me. Uh, as you mentioned, I think certainly the key for the Titans, if they're going to spring this kind of upset, uh, is ball control, ball possession. You look at that second half uh, against the Patriots, uh, Titans had the ball almost 20 of the 30 minutes uh, against the Patriots, which gave Tom Brady obviously very little time to work any traditional Tom Brady magic. Uh, and I think that's going to have to be a similar situation in Baltimore. And, and it's interesting, too, you know, when you think of Bill Belichick and, and what he does to teams, well, you always say, okay, the Patriots are going to take away your top threat, make you do something different. Well, I'm sure he tried to take away Derrick Henry uh, as best he could. You know, Derrick Henry was running into to eight defenders in the box, uh, you know, 25, 30% of the time against the Patriots, but he couldn't stop him. 182 yards there. Derrick Henry's gone over 100 yards in six of the past seven games when everyone is trying to stop him. So it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to me. In, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've almost got some similarities between Henry and Jackson. Everybody knows what's coming. Uh, it's just a question of whether it can be stopped or not. But then there's Dean Pease and, uh, you know, uh, his bad two toward the Patriots. And, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure nobody was happier about knocking the Patriots out than the whistleblower on the flake gate. Uh, and now he comes back in here. Um, you know, after sort of retiring for five minutes until Vrabel could, you know, put the band back together and, uh, you know, uh, put the Patriots Mafia together down there on the Cumberland, and yet here they come, and, and they're playing again. And Dean Pease, so one thing he hasn't had to do is draw up a game plan with some sort of coordination to neutralize Lamar, if not stop him. And I think their best chance is to spring the ball free uh, or to spring the ball up in the air like uh, the pick at the end of the game the other day, which was just you know sort of a random play. If that happens a couple of times, that's how a 10-point favorite that hasn't lost in three months loses at home on a Saturday night to the 9-7 the and seven Titans, right? Right, right, exactly. You're going to have to have something uh, out of the ordinary, I think, break in the, in the Titans' favor, whether that's a big special teams play whether that's one or two turnovers that, that, that this team wasn't expecting. Uh, because certainly the way the Ravens have been playing for three months, uh, nearly impossible to beat. I was just looking back at their uh, the schedule again, and I think only four of the last 12 wins have been within one score <laughs> victories for the, uh, for the Ravens. So really an incredible run here for, for that team. Uh, I, I think, you know, as you mentioned, it's, it's kind of a second homecoming week in a row for, uh, for Dean Pease. Um, and, and I think uh, the Titans' strength, as I say on defense, is generally playing against the run. They've got a pretty good uh, front seven, so you know that, that's to their favor. But, but again, as I mentioned earlier, a key in all of that, if the Titans don't have Jay on Brown this week, an inside linebacker, quick, mobile, they're going to have a tough, tough time stopping Lamar Jackson and, and creating any of those uh, kinds of turnovers. Fun little tournament we have going on here, right? I mean, they, uh, as someone who covers it, it makes your life interesting, right? When you get on the bus pulling out of Foxborough and they've actually won and extended the season, right? Like, it is sort of rarefied air. We've done, I remember Joe Flacco, I was sitting having an iced tea with him when I was writing about after the Super Bowl a couple weeks. I'm up in his hometown in Philadelphia. He, like, would, he would bristle up. He was a Philadelphia guy, you know? He said, we do a lot of winning around here. We win a lot of football games games around here and you you don't realize that until you go five years and not making the playoffs and you don't win playoff games and even when you have a home game last year you don't win it's really hard to win and win on the road and extend this sort of thing but there is some fairy dust involved in it right and when you go up to Foxborough and win you do feel like you can win anywhere well that's that's just it you know I, I, say, I think there's a lot of, of sort of bitterness and, and disappointment among Titans fans here. It had been so long since they'd seen much of any success. You know, they had the one playoff appearance in a decade, uh, had one playoff win in a, in a decade. So even as the Titans sort of uh, uh, struggled a bit in their last, uh, or two of their last three regular season games against the Texans and the Saints, you still heard of a lot of that, you know, all same old Titans are going to, you know, they're going to choke down the stretch. They're not going to get it done. Then you go down to Houston and, and you win a game down there against a you know a, a depleted Texan squad, but still 
a place that you hadn't won in quite some time against a uh, a team that you hadn't beaten uh, regularly in, in quite some time. You pick up that win, and then to go up into New England and, and knock off the uh, the Pats dynasty up there, there, there really is much more of a, a belief now, I think, among this team. And even though they lost those two out of the last three regular season games, I think overall this team has been playing pretty well. You know, those are two narrow losses to two very good teams. Uh, but, but generally speaking, you know, since Tannehill took over, this is an 8-3 and three Titans team since then. As I said, averaging about 30 points a game. They've, they've developed a pretty good, uh, you know, amount of confidence. And, and I think, you know, they they're really seem to be playing their best football right now. So uh, I, I think at least we're going to see a decent competitive game. Uh, whether the Titans can spring that upset, I'm, I'm not certain about that. I would have my doubts. But I think it'll be a, a, a closer game than, than maybe the uh, – the uh, national bookmakers are suggesting. Well, we all have our doubts, which is why I'm going to Miami looking for Super Bowl party locations here. <laughs> hey, I, I will hope to see you. Bring some barbecue up here. We'll make sure you get over to Fadley's and you never eat a tourist crab cake in my town. And uh, we've been at this a long time. These big games in January, uh, it it, uh, it makes what we do a whole lot uh, more rich and colorful. I'm sure we'll have one to remember on Saturday night. Thanks for coming on, John. Appreciate you, man. Sure, thanks for having me, Nancy. You got it. Glennon on sports, the way to find him. Uh, Glennon Sports. There you go. It's not Glennon on sports. Glenn on sports. Glennon Sports. Glenn on sports. He writes for The Athletic. You can find him there covering the Titans, Predators, soccer, and more, as well as writing books about the uh, Nashville Predators and... uh, Little Trot's history. I, somewhere over there is my mustard jersey up in the closet that I haven't worn in quite some time. I haven't worn my Capitals jersey in quite some time either. But I got Raven stuff everywhere. Uh, if you need information on the Miami trip, throw me an email, nasty at WNSD.net. We have a new camera with a wider angle here now, so I, I better shave for the camera from time to time. Great sponsorships, lots of great stuff going on. Baltimore Positive happening. We have Martin O'Malley next Friday at Fadley. Speaking of great crab cakes, next Thursday we're with Brian Frosch at State Fair in Catonsville. And yes, I am headed off to Miami getting you information for all things Super Bowl. Tuesday night, Sam Cook joining us at Greenmount Station in Hampstead. Come on out, get swapped for the Bone Marrow Registry, and say hello to Sam, who uh, hopefully uh, the best games are when Sam doesn't punt. <laughs> he might not say that. But that means it's a pretty flawless football game when that happens. If that's the case on Saturday night, we'll be playing for the AFC Championship game here next week. I am Nestor. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, WNST Towson, Baltimore. Find us out in the buy at Toyota.com Audio Vault where we never stop talking. Baltimore Sports.